welcome to our worship service. If you have downloaded the bulletin, you will be able to join me in our responsive worship parts. So it's wonderful to have you here as we gather to praise God. And a reminder that we meet physically in the parking lot on Sunday mornings at 930. But in case of inclement weather, would you please um, notice the cancellations that we will have. They will be found on the email blasts, on the church website, the church Facebook page, and also on the church answering machine. So if in doubt, please check one of those before you leave home. We continue to remember in our prayers all those who are not able to be with us, either in person or those who are homebound, grieving, or sick. Those include Job Mangus, Wayne Peicher, Linda Gartner, John Zettelmoyer, Wayne Kaufman, Nancy Harding, Stuart Dreibelbiss, and recently Carol Stout. We also remember the families of Ruth Ballard, Alma Clapper, Alma Clapper and Helen Lamb. This Saturday, will be Helen Lamb's private memorial graveside service here in Haines Cemetery. Thank you as usual to those of you who have been in contact with church members and who have let me know how they are doing. I hear good things from them when I phone them. They appreciate being remembered and this is really an important way to keep those members connected. So now let's take a moment to prepare our minds and hearts to worship God. And we pray, maker of our days, you created each of us unique, beings with different strengths and weaknesses. Help us not only to use our strengths to assist others, but also to allow others to use their strengths to meet our weaknesses. We pray together, restorer of our souls, you have seen the parched places we have made in our lives, along with the devastation thrust upon us by the action or inaction of others. Meet us in all the places of our deepest pain, so that our facades of self-sufficiency might fall away, and we might be drawn into right relationship with you and with one another. Breath of our lives, without you, we are but a mound of clay. Fill us with your presence, invigorate our worship, and set us on fire so that others might be drawn into your light and nurtured by the warmth of your loving care. We join in our call to worship responsively for those of you who have copies of the bulletin. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like a summer rain which restores the parched earth. It is like a cool breeze at the shore of a lake, at the top of a mountain, or through a crowded city street. God meets us here. We have gathered to worship the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives. As we are asked in scripture, we come together to confess our sins to God and to one another before we continue worshiping God. When we try to go it on our own, lacking faith in divine providence, Lord have mercy. When we have not recognized God at work in the faith of others, Christ have mercy. For all that we have done and all that we have left undone, Lord have mercy. Let's take a quiet moment to reflect and confess within our hearts.
God calls each of us by name and cries out with tears of joy as we recognize God in our admission of need. Praise be to God who welcomes us as we are, challenges us to let go of our guilt and provides a way for us to walk on together. Our prayers today for the people as we look out into the world are set up a little bit differently. We're going to hear, at least in our imaginations, from individuals who need prayer. So dear Lord, help us to hear these various voices of people we don't often pray for or think about. First, I pray today that my knees and back hold up. I pray that my mom and children are okay in their two bedroom apartment while I work at a hotel and clean 15 rooms each day. I pray that my paycheck will be enough, that my car holds up, that someone cares about me enough to say hello or to give a smile. There are approximately 926,960 maids and housekeeping cleaners in the United States. Sometimes cleaners are assigned 30 rooms in a day. Across the barrier of our indifference, awaken us to the other. Help us to understand the burdens they carry, O Christ, by your grace. May we understand the equity built into a living wage, the costs of health care and child care, housing and food, transportation and school supplies. Person two. I was a child soldier in Liberia, but first I was a schoolboy. I still pray for my grandparents. The soldiers arrived and took me away. I was taught to fight. Smoking drugs would energize us. The war is over, long over, and many of us are trying to get off the drugs. I pray that I can leave this sad life. What price must I pay for my country's war? I pray that I am not abandoned and shunned. I pray that God will protect me and hear my voice. The UN investigates and reports on child soldiers. The top ranking countries are Afghanistan, Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, Myanmar, Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, and Yemen. Children, children as young as eight are used as combatants, guards, human shields, hoarders, messengers, spies, cooks, and or for sexual purposes. Girl soldiers are often used as wives and sexually abused by their commanders and other soldiers. Iraq's Kurdish, Kurdish and Yazidi children were recruited. Myanmar children are forcibly recruited into the National Army. In Nigeria, girls ages seven and eight were used as suicide bombers. In Somalia, over 900 children were recruited and posted at checkpoints. Two factions in South Sudan have taken over 17,000 children. In Syria, warring sides have recruited children as young and seven, half are under age 15. They have been exploited in propaganda videos. In Yemen, where we pray that those suffering from starvation will be cared for, boys are recruited to fight on all sides. Across the world, where these horrendous injustices continue against the most vulnerable, their childhood swept away, torn from their families, 
O Christ, by your grace, we call out against war and these atrocities. Help us to take right action. Help us to speak out against militarization. We pray for those suffering and the loss to their families. Voice three. Will my land flood and be silted over, taking away our livelihood? I feel there is nothing to do but wait and watch. I pray we will be safe and not lose everything. The wind is picking up and the rain has already been falling. River flooding in population dense countries includes India, Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, Pakistan, Indonesia, Egypt, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Brazil, Thailand, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq, and Cambodia. O oh Christ, in your mercy, protect these countries from what seems to be inevitable flooding and a cycle of loss and destitution. We pray for those in harm's way around the world. Give us the ability to work together to share resources and contribute knowledge to reduce this suffering. Be with emergency transport, the healthcare workers, the utility crews, the engineers, and their teams as they design and plan and understand the rivers that bring life and death. Voice four. We are the over 17,000 healthcare workers who have died of COVID-19. We did our work, loved our work, trained many years, endured long hours, cried and spoke out, and then we too became sick. We were not indifferent or complacent. We pray that this pandemic will end and that the billions of people under this veil of suffering will find comfort, that leaders will come together in reason and generosity of heart and mind. Medscape publishes the names of workers around the world. We name these few in remembrance of so many. Onyanachi Abasi, 51 nurse, Health National Health Service, Barking and Dagenham, London, England. Morteza Voidan, age unknown, general practitioner, Mashhad, Iran. Patricia Wilkie, 63, pharmacist, Winslow, Arizona. Valerio Prepa, 59, head of the radiological imaging department, Chisinau, Moldova. Rosalinda Rose Pulido, 46, oncologist, San Juan de Dios Hospital, Jose City, Philippines. Freddie Powell Hing, 59, interventional cardiologist, Hospital IESS Duran in Duran, Ecuador. Anonymous, 62, organ transplantation, Wuhan, China. O Christ, in your compassion and mercy, give us the will to endure, care, and remember. Voice five, we're still in shock. We're still refusing to believe that something happened. We still think it's like a dream or something. It was terrifying. It was horrible. Residents of Beirut, Lebanon are still reeling after an explosion of ammonium nitrate leveled the port, injuring at least 50,000 people and leaving at least 137 dead. Residents have been working together to clear the rubble 
and investigations seeking to determine responsibility are underway as residents grieve and begin to rebuild from the devastation. Voice six, I am a tree, a forest, a bird, a butterfly, a bumblebee, a bat. I have no human voice. My habitat is shrinking and yet I cling to beautiful nature. Hear my song, the wind moving in the fur, the singing wetland, the happy buzz and light wings receive our offerings. O oh Lord, we have trespassed on our own earth. We have stolen and killed, sprayed and paved over, and cut down without thought to seven generations. Forgive us. Approximately 30,000 species per year, about three per hour, are being driven to extinction. Where is our mindfulness? Nearly 80% of species diversity of our world is destroyed because of habitat loss. Approximately 5,760 acres per day or 240 acres per hour. Christ, in your mercy, awaken us to our stewardship. Help us to live and step lightly. O oh Lord, call us to your table of life. Remind us of the mighty work we need to do to care for each and all. Rest us at night and renew us for this day that is before us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join together in our affirmation of faith as it's found in your bulletin. We believe in the spirit who blows through our lives, unsettling us, stirring us up, propelling us forward. We believe in the spirit who comes as fire, warming us, empowering us, remaking us. We believe in the spirit who frees our tongues for talking of God, for prayer, for advocacy. We believe in the spirit, the counselor, the helper, the breath of God. Amen. We are still called to make our offering. We can do that online, by mail, or if you have another alternative, you can contact Donald Hummel via the church office phone. In times of plenty and want, God provides for our deepest needs. Give generously out of the abundance of God's blessing so that in these challenging times, God's work might continue. If you are able, please join me in the prayer of offering. Holy God, you are our provider. We dedicate to your service our lives and these offerings from, wit, from your blessing and from our labor. Work in us and through us to extend your love and care here and around the world. Amen. Our worship service will continue with Pastor Dan. Greetings, friends, and welcome to this part of our service for the scripture reading and for the sermon. Uh, if you hear the sound of thunder and lightning, it's because that's what's happening outside of my office slash studio here in Warminster. Uh, hopefully, it will allow us to at least complete this section of our video service uh, before we lose power. So if if I plan this correctly, I have certain key points where I'd like for God to send just a little bit of thunder uh, to get your attention. 
but I cannot promise that uh, at all. So if you hear the thunder, believe me, I, I was not able to orchestrate that all. It's totally in the hands of Mother Nature. Let's have a prayer before we read our scripture. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for your word, which is truth, which is hope, which is courage for us when we are facing difficult times. May the word now lodge in our minds and in our hearts and give us your gifts. Amen. The scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 15. It's in two sections, 10 through 20 and then 21 through 28. It's a bit of an unusual section. Hopefully I can talk about some of that in the sermon, but it's really two stories. They do have a link to each other, but on the surface that may not appear that's the case. Matthew 15, 10 through 20. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides to the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both of them will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out and into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. And now we move to the second portion of this reading, Matthew 15, 21 through 28. This is a story labeled and known as the Canaanite woman's faith. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, Great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you walk. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word, said Teviev in the musical Fiddler on the Roof. That one word is tradition. These are the opening lines from that musical, a story of struggling Jews at the end of the turn of the 20th century in Russia. Teviot, the main character, declares that tradition is the glue that holds everything together. He says it tells us when and what to eat. It tells us who and when to marry. It tells us the roles each person plays in the life of the community. Tradition, Teviot would tell us, is the very thing which makes for peace and harmony. Jesus encounters tradition in our text today, and while he may share in Tevye's sense of its importance, he also realizes that it can be a confining and controlling part of community life, even to its detriment. Chapter 10 in Matthew opens with us overhearing Jesus in a very heated discussion about tradition. The drama begins with Jesus making a very alarming statement. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. That's in verse 11. One commentator notes the statement is like turning Jewish dietary laws on their head. 
He says, while most of the religious community was preoccupied with what would defile and hurt the body, Jesus was more concerned with what comes out of our bodies that can defile and hurt the world. That's from Doc Hollingsworth in Feasting on the Word. Curiously, Jesus, the disciples do not appear to be on the side of Jesus. In verse 12, the disciples let Jesus know the Pharisees took offense at what they heard he had said. Peter, ever the one to be quick with a question or a comment, remember, two weeks ago he was jumping out of the boat into the water, walking to Jesus and almost drowned himself. He asked for an explanation. No surprise. And no surprise, Jesus gives him one that is direct and to the point. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, and false witness. The ethical point could not be more sharp and his critique of tradition more pointed. But here we must be careful about tradition. Jesus is not condemning tradition per se, rather an understanding about the role of tradition. His, here his condemnation is about traditionalism, not tradition. The noted patristic professor Yaroslav Pelikan Patristics is a term used in seminaries to mean the early church fathers from the t who led the church and wrote about theology and faith and liturgy from the time of Jesus' death until about 300 AD. Yaroslav Pelikan, great name, scholar of Christian theology and medieval intellectual history at Yale. Here's what he says. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. This was the focus of Jesus' statement that tradition, a meaningful historical guide in every generation, had been transformed into traditionalism, which was a worship of the tradition and its application, devoid of any capacity for justice, mercy, or kindness. Traditionalism cannot be a sufficient base for ethics or morality because it cannot permit any other relevant issues to be considered. It becomes like an iron box, rigid, cold, not permitting any other context or human or psychological exigencies to be considered. Words such as compassion, mercy, kindness could not be included in the vocabulary of traditionalism. This was, of course, in direct contradiction to the work and ministry of Jesus, which consistently emphasized the attributes traditionalism excluded. We know from our own experience, especially in the church, this truth. We know that the church battles fought for God are fought in the name of tradition. Gary Charles observes rightly, tradition can mean anything from a worship practice that occurs more than once to a liturgical rite that the church has practiced for generations. Tradition can provide a solid yet flexible foundation for faithfulness, but it can also function in the opposite way. In this text, Jesus chastises the official keepers of Jewish tradition for having squeezed the life and liveliness out of their tradition until, as he says, it had calcified into an irrelevant religious relic or worse. The narrative of the opening of Matthew certainly provides hope and inspiration that faith must move beyond traditionalism to a flexible and reflexive approach to tradition, which gives us a history for reflection to move forward to meet new and important ethical situations. But then the second part of this reading appears to undercut everything Jesus has said. In fact, on the surface, one might conclude, falsely I would say, that Jesus sounds just like the Pharisees he condemned earlier. In this text, verses 21 through 28, we find Jesus confronted by a Canaanite woman. 
The word Canaanite is charged with theological and historical significance for all Jews. Notes Ewan Russell Jones, it stirs up memories of ancient foes, idol worshiping enemies over against whom the people of Israel defined themselves. Recall the Canaanites were the inhabitants of the land that Israel, Israel came into at the time of the conquest under Joshua. There were huge gaps between these groups, as were the relations between Jews and Samaritans. There's additional discrimination toward the woman as well. Women were expected to be reserved and quiet. Here the opposite confronts Jesus, a woman who is loud, confrontive, argumentative, and defiant. She has claimed roles for herself reserved for men, and the disciples are not having any of it. They ask Jesus to basically shut her up. Sound familiar? In the discussion with Jesus, the woman has a simple request to heal her daughter who is suffering from demon possession. Now remember, demon possession was a catch-all term for a lot of things that uh, today would be easily resolved either with medicine or psychotherapy. But Jesus is quiet and unresponsive to her claim. The disciples intervene and try to remove her, but she would not relent. Remember the story of the woman who likewise pestered a judge in the parable of the unjust judge in Luke 18, 1 through 8. Now tradition, of which Jesus pontificated on, comes into play, and the text doesn't paint a very complimentary picture. Some recent commentators see this as a moment when Jesus is, quote, caught with his compassion down and forced to confront his own prejudice, which is a reversal of the usual roles we see of Jesus in the New Testament. Here, the respected teacher learns from an outsider the need to broaden his ministry of hospitality to those outside the house of Israel. It appears Jesus is caught in his own understanding of traditionalism and does not wish or is unable to act on what he has stated is the basis of relationship to God, not traditionalism, but faith in God's ability to move beyond all traditions, to move through any tradition, even the traditions as rigid as nature itself in order to perform miracles, which he does here. Her plea is summarized in the phrase, Lord, have mercy. Specifically, she calls out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Here she appeals to Jesus' own tradition. She understands the power of tradition by calling upon the history of David as the sine qua non of Israel's history as a nation. Her calls for mercy also reflect the core of Jesus' own ministry. Twice in previous clashes with the Pharisees, over questions of ritual purity. He quotes Hosea 6.6. 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy is the cornerstone of his critique of their religion and lifestyle. Yet Jesus continued to resist her supplications, arguing that his ministry is intended first to the Jews, his own people. The woman does not object to God having mercy on Jews, but places the entire discussion on understanding the fact that the fundamental basis of election is God's decision to be a merciful God. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Exodus 33:19 and Romans 9:15. Here's the bottom line. While mercy may begin with Israel, she knows it cannot end there. At least she believes it cannot end there. Because of the very nature of Israel's God, it overflows to others in the house, even to the so-called dogs that Jesus used to describe the Jews' understanding of Canaanites. 
Tradition cannot control the gift of mercy. While it can serve as a historical reminder of its importance, it can not keep it safe as in a bank from which mercy is dispensed based on some delimiter such as ethnicity or gender or social class or mental or physical condition. God's mercy is unlimited, not limited. God's mercy is not owned by any religious group or theological position. It is uniquely a quality of God's own person and flows from God's own self. This essence was expressed in those great lines from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice when he wrote these words. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mighty. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein does set the dread and fear of kings. But mercy is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show like us gods when mercy seasons justice. Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy. And that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoke this much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if thou follow, this strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchant there. Of all the wonderful qualities of the great and long tradition of St. John's Haynes Church, I hope history will say about us, mercy was always present here. Mercy was always given freely and found freely through faith in God. As much as we are keepers of this tradition, we are also aware we don't control it or dispense it, but we do help others to receive it, to share it to be it ourselves and never be numb to the cries of those who plead, Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Kind and gracious God, you are merciful to all of us. But often your mercy is taken for granted. We don't think about it very much, except when we're in trouble when we feel that we have broken our relationships with others and ourselves and with you. We pray that your mercy is still available to us. We know it is, but we have to claim it and believe it. Strengthen our faith that we might indeed receive your mercy, but also be courageous enough to offer your mercy to all and anyone we meet. Amen. We thank you for joining us today. We're going to continue doing this for a while. We're hoping that on October the 4th, World Communion Sunday, we will be able to re-enter our sanctuary and worship in that sacred space. We will be providing information for you about how to do that because we've taken the time, the leadership of the church, through the consistory, to ensure that we do all the safety measures we can so that when you come to church, you will know and feel confident that you can trust it is safe for you to be there. There will be some restrictions, naturally. We have to observe the guidelines set forth by the medical community, and we will do that, and we ask for your cooperation when we do that. You will be receiving a letter in the next couple of weeks that explains all of this, and we are excited about being again together in the sanctuary of the Saint John's Haynes UCC Church. Now receive these words of benediction. You have been reconciled with Christ. Do the work of Christ in the world. Extend support to those in need. Speak up for those cast aside. Build bridges of reconciliation. Strengthen the bonds of community. 
knowing that the maker of our days, the restorer of our souls, and the breath of our lives will be with you this day and forever and more. Amen. Now the peace of Christ be with you. The comfort and consolation of the Holy Spirit surround you this week. May God's mercy rest upon you. Amen.